Yo, everybody. Welcome to Off Panel, a weekly interview podcast about all things comics, brought to you by Sketch.com. I'm your host, David Harper, and this week's guest is the co-host of the X-Men podcast, Bow the Atom, and one of the folks behind the comic site, Comics XF. It's Zach Jenkins. Thanks for coming on, Zach. Hey, David. Thanks for having me. This is fun. I like I like, I like, like being here. This is a cozy, cozy little podcast to, you know, spend some time. Well, this is your second time on. For You know, you have a unique distinction. You're the only person who ever came on for one of my book club episodes, which never became a thing. It was a one-time yeah. thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that my appearance was very successful and definitely made uh, that segment a real hit. <laughs> well, this time we're here to talk about not one of the books of the month, but we're here to talk about you've uh, your your uh, there's been some changes around your neck of the woods. For listeners that don't know, Comics XF is is Zach's comic site, uh, Zach and Friends's comic site, but it started as a depot i mean i don't even know what to describe it as originally it was like a depot for your rankings and battle of the atom i mean what else, what would you describe xavier files as originally all right yeah so xavier files was me sitting at my breakfast uh table one one fine saturday morning and saying i should i can write about x-men i'm sure i could do it so i just i just on a whim decided i would rank all of the x-men uh, because people like ranking things. Oh yeah. Uh, it's, it's a gimmick and it doesn't have to mean anything, but people love seeing numbers in front of, uh, thoughts. Mm -hmm. So did that started writing it. And, and that was back on Tumblr. It was a little blog there and it took off in a weird way. Like there, there were people invested in it, which was weird. Cause I'm a bad writer. And at, you know, back then I was even worse. And it eventually it started going and I was an ambitious person and kept trying to grow things and grow things. So I started a couple of podcasts that didn't really go anywhere and then ended up with Bow the Atom, uh, where we used a very similar concept. Uh, me and my co-host, Adam Reck, uh, ranking all of the X-Men stories that have ever existed three an episode, uh, which is just a fun framework to talk about dumb X-Men stories uh, that we fe feel like talking about. Uh, and from there it just kind of snowballed and snowballed we did a few interview here and there uh made some connections in the industry made some friends and ended up uh having a couple of my buddies uh pitch a big old thing about house of x powers of 10 when that came out mm -hmm. uh, and they wanted to do a page by page panel by panel annotation and i said whatever that sounds fun and we started doing it and it took off a lot yeah and then and then we got uh, contacted by Polygon and they said, hey, we would like to pay you uh, for this content if we can just put it on our website. And that's when it clicked and said, oh, no, we have smart people here now. <laughs> oh, no, we did something good on accident. And we said, hey, let's uh, th this Grave Train's not going to last forever. This this series is only 12 issues. Uh, what if we just kept doing it for other books? Mm hmm. On our site, where we, you know, wouldn't make money, but, you know, we could still do it for funsies. And we brought in a bunch of our friends and talented, uh, talented writers in their own right, uh, from honestly, from about every comic site out there. Yeah, uh, we, we've got we've got some people who work across the industry uh, and they we started doing these kind of conversational pieces about every book, trying to emulate the feel of chatting about a book in a fictional comic shop. Uh, that I've never had that experience, but it's like the ideal of what you wanted a good comic shop experience to be. Wait, 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 wait. So you've, uh, are, are you saying you've never had that because have you not been near a comic shop or you've just never been to a comic shop where that type of thing happened? Oh, all of the comic shops around me have been just trash awful. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely love and adore uh, when there are great physical retailers, uh, in fact, I got back into comics at one point because I had a friend in college who had forgotten about his pull list slash hadn't driven down there to pick it up mm -hmm. in about three months. And he, he was he was good. He was one of the guys that came in and said, hey, I would like this very large stack of comics now. Right. Uh, but the 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 guy who owned the shop, uh, I was just browsing and he saw that I was, I was talking about X-Men and he said, Hey, this run is really good. And I said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to start buying this run. And then I did. And I, I've been buying monthly ever since. And it was but, a Chuck Austin run. 
it was not. It was actually it was the Bendis, uh, Bendis and Chris Bachelow. Oh, okay. Uh, Uncanny. I had I had been reading a little bit before then the Kieran Gillen stuff through mail orders, which is a bad way to read comics. Um, because at the time I was in college and they were getting sent to my house, and my mom thought they were junk mail. Oh no. Uh, so- that was that was uh, frustrating to say the least, but uh, eventually sorted it all out. And yeah, I, I got into it and I always wanted that community experience. It was something that I've liked from online spaces. Yeah. And getting to th- there's a weird thing where like parasocial relationships are not good, but. And I'm not not saying in any way we are trying to build parasocial relationships, but there's something to be said about knowing who a writer is on a high level and wanting to hear their voice and their opinion. Like, I know that if I go over to Sketched, for example, uh, I'm not going to get an unbiased opinion on Kaiju Max, but I'm I'm going to know that like, oh, this is a comic that you know, I don't think David would really like, but he he seems hot on it. So maybe I'd like it or, okay, this is where our tastes align. And this is where it doesn't. Yeah. That whole influencer tastemaker aspect of things Mm -hmm. in comics, I think is an untapped, untapped space and hasn't really been tapped. And I'm, this is going to be the first time that I say a cursed word that it, that I have a lot of very mixed feelings about, but this is, it's something that has been a vacuum since comics or not comicsology, excuse me, comics Alliance was shut down. Oh boy. I thought you were going to actually Again, say a curse word, not actually. No, Comics no, Alliance. no. I'm a, I'm a good boy. Comics Alliance was not the savior of the comic book industry. They were doing a lot of things good, and they had funding. Uh, they weren't perfect, uh, and there's plenty of sites that are doing great stuff. They just don't have the money, so you should support them. Uh, but, uh, you know, they built they built a website on personality. Yeah. It, it was good content, but it was a bunch of blogs that came together, and those blogs had personality. So that's that's something that we said that was a good idea that no one else is picking up on. We should emulate that. Yeah. And we did. And then we realized that the name Xavier Files was very X-Men and we had stopped being just X-Men. It's still our prime audience. It's still our bread and butter. And it's still what like I like. I'm staring at a picture of Sauron and Glob Herman from Wolverine and the X-Men 28 uh, in front of my computer every day. I care about the X-Men, but there's other comics out there and I want to have a space that like. If I'm reading a book and I said, this is dope, someone should signal boost this, I can give it a shot. I'm, I'm not I don't have the biggest audience in the world, but I can do my part. And heck, I want to write about it. And so does my staff. And that's fun. Two things. First up, was that Nick Bradshaw? Uh, no, this is uh, Ramon Perez. Oh, it was Ramon. That was Ramon Perez. I don't know why it's in my the, head. Uh, it's the arc where they go the to kids. the Savage Land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a great Glob, arc. Glob makes a bad mistake. Oh, that's a really good arc. Wolverine and the X-Men, so good. Second off, I want to say, my opinion on Kaiju Max, unbiased. It's just a fact, I want to say. I'm at least partially kidding. I'm not kidding. I love Kaiju Max. Um, but um, I, I do, you know, I want to go back really quick. I do think it's funny, though, because, you know, you, you said you were, you know, let's, let's go with your idea that you're a bad writer, which I'm going to disagree with. However, I will say, there's, like, merit to being bad at ranking, I mean, let, let's say, like, you had a perfect, somehow irrefutable ranking of the X-Men, which is completely impossible. But let's say that oh, thing... Oh, I disagree it, with... I disagree with everything <laughs> I've ranked constantly. Like, what, man, I was being dumb when I said that. I think... Be, uh, but I think bad being a bad ranker or, like, just having something like that, that is a really good way. Because, I mean, that that in of itself, that type of thing is what you're talking about. Because, like, I feel like the vast majority of comic shop discussions... And those types of things that you're trying to do now with Comics XF, those like, um, you know, those those conversational elements, which I really love, are based on the idea that every comic isn't just a comic. It's a jump off point to connect about something. And rankings are great at that. They are they are absolutely fun because they spark an emotion. It it doesn't matter if it's a good emotion or a bad emotion necessarily. I mean, I'm not I'm not out there to upset people. But I would rather someone feel intensely like I disagree with you on this versus not feeling anything. Like if I click through a top 10 list of something like I did, I did a uh, I did a freelance thing for Polygon over the summer uh, that was top 10 Wolverine stories. And if you feel that with, you know, OK, let's see. Well, number one, oh, it's the it's the Claremont Frank Miller Wolverine. That's great. Oh, old man Logan's on this list. Look at those those great Wolverine stories that are on everything. 
it's it's boring. It's bad. It's not going to provoke a response. Yeah. But if you if you say, hey, you remember that time that Wolverine fought a pile of sentient cocaine? Uh, then people are going to have a response to that, even if that is a bad arc, which is not true. It's fantastic. Uh, absolutely buck wild. It ties into Acts of Vengeance. It's beautiful. Oh, Acts of Vengeance, man. I kind of I was actually just thinking about one of those. Uh, it, the, Acts of Vengeance had some amazing Steve Epting covers on the. Uh, on the Avengers titles. And like, I remember this is one that has like professor X and like Quicksilver and God crystal and a number of other characters on it. And it's just like this iconic cover that I always loved. There was something about covers when I was a kid that just had a lot of characters on it looking cool that just like immediately sold it for me. Like uncanny X-Men 268. I don't know if you remember that Jim Lee cover where it's Wolverine, black widow and captain America. When I saw the three of them together, I was just like, how is this possible? It's unbelievable. David, David, David did you think I, don't remember Match I Report know. Nights. I'm, I'm saying for other David, I'm David, for I have, listeners. I have, that, I have that comic seared into my brain. <laughs> if, Jim Lee, if Jim Lee wouldn't have been a coward and canceled all of his C2E2 appearances last year after, okay, well, Dan Didio left and DC was in a weird place and they hadn't technically announced anything before the con, uh, I was going to get that comic signed, but not the original printing, a printing of a board game adaptation of it that marvel did interesting i had the x-men board game was there another one no so this was this is the weirdest thing i forget what it's called but it's like a uh it's like a like the size of espn the magazine if you remember that yes yes uh, like an oversized magazine and it was it had a board game in it but it was a comic that had that whole thing that whole story going through it, like between the board game panels and some of the pages in the comic were just like the line art. Some of it was just inks. It was, it's a really weird way to reprint something. This is really blowing my mind right now. It's pretty darn cool. Anyway, Jim Lee wasn't there. And also if he was, I probably would have said, I don't want to pay $200 <laughs> for this. This is a bit. I don't care that much. Yeah. Yeah. But I brought it. Dang it. I am interested in, okay. So you, you, you decided that it wasn't just an X-Men site anymore, so you needed to migrate. Why Comics XF is the name? Oh, yeah. So we uh, pitched a lot of different names in our group. It was something that, you know, part of it was Xavier Files was very closely related to me personally. And I am against a lot of people's understanding a big introvert. And I didn't I no longer wanted that. Uh, and And the other thing was, well. I wanted to kind of be generic. Like if I'm, if I'm being very real, we looked at all of the, uh, all the sites that are out there and said, what can we do that one pulls from like an easy sense of continuity from the old site to the new. Mm -hmm. And what can two, I guess, initialize well, which CXF works really well for us. Right. And, and then three, what looks generic enough so that we fool people into thinking we're bigger than we are. Sure. And that's that's really what it came down to is like we we played with a few things. We tried to, you know, we we knew comics was like a good indicator that this is a comic book website. So we wanted that in there. Yeah. And then we we threw a few out. Uh, XF Comics went really far until we realized that it looked like the XFL logo <laughs> when we uh, put it together. And we said, well, this would be fun, but we also can't do that. I mean, you could have. You just would have been sued by Vince McMahon or whoever owns the XFL I now. I don't even know who owns it. Is it The Rock? Just The Rock? I think it might be just now? The Rock. I don't know. I, I, does that make Will Nevin he hate me? I don't know. Yes. I yes. like that. It, 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 it 100% does. <laughs> oh, my God. People listen to this. I like how I explain the Uncanny X-Men 268 cover, but I'm making reference to uh, – well, I don't even remember what that guy's full name was, but he hate me from XFL. Uh, no one's going to get that reference, but I mean, it, it makes sense. It's like, I remember when I was trying to name sketched and believe me, like coming up with a name that has no vowels in it is a very good way to get people to pronounce your name a lot of different ways and a lot of, and, and have people like people still call off panel, the sketched podcast, they put off dash panel in it. They put all kinds of different things. There's a lot of things I would have been smart to have, have actually run by other people. So it's good that you had a wide variety of perspectives to weigh in on this because I don't know. I mean, comics XF, it just kind of combines nicely. The CXF it by itself, like looks nice on merch and pairs well with everything else. It's a good name. It's, it's a good choice. We were, we were 
lucky enough. Uh, we had a we had our core team that you know everyone was pitching in, but we had a few individuals, uh, Jason Large, Emily Harding, and uh, Andrea Ayers, uh, who are all great friends, fantastic at their stuff. But uh, I don't actually know everyone's real job, but it's between marketing, digital media, uh, Hollywood stuff in production, and like just. A lot of people who have way more talent than they should throw at this dumb comic book website, and they were they were able to put their nose to the grindstone and do some absolutely phenomenal work that blew me away every time we got an update of. Actually, we like we like it like this. We think this will make it look better. We did have one time where we had a logo we really liked until we realized that it did use the exact same font as the 2011 era X Men logo, and we had to say no to that. Sure. Yeah, that, that's always an important consideration. We got real deep until we said, why does this X look familiar? <laughs> well, I mean, the problem with uh, X-Men stuff is they've uh, they found a lot of different ways to render Xs. I have to admit, Comics XF, I don't know why in my brain, it just immediately makes me start thinking of Uncanny X-Force, even though there's absolutely no, I mean, besides the fact it's X-Men related, but... Yeah, UXF. Yeah, that's UXF. What I call Uncanny X-Force. Yeah, that, I, I have... Comics XF like seared into my mind of okay, I have to deal with this every morning. Uh, but no, yeah, UXF that that's what we call that very good run of X Force. Yep, it is a very good run. Uh, well, okay, so I want to talk about the you know where you were when you were first starting this because I know that one of the important considerations you and the rest of the team had was Xavier Files had you know I I don't want to say run its course because it, it was evolving fittingly to the X Men. Uh, it was evolving beyond its original mission statement. You wanted to broaden the horizons and everything like that. I know in the process, the buildup, that you were looking at the landscape of comic sites. I'm curious as to what the process was when you were all rethinking the site. Like, what went into your thinking when you were, you know, reconsidering all of, you know, what, what was going on in the comic site world and, like, what shape you might take the site in? Sure. So, there are a couple things we realized right away. Because, uh, so... I have I have a background in uh, marketing. I've got my MBA with a focus on that, uh, and not that I do digital marketing like as my day job, but I know enough to keep myself dangerous. So I ran analytics and stuff on all the comic sites. I think I have a list of uh, how many eighty eight different comics related websites. Uh, from you know the big entertainment sites uh, that just cover comics like Hollywood Reporter or IGN to little one-off sites uh, like uh, Shelf Dust or Comfort Food Comics or stuff like that that are very small new. But I wanted to get an understanding of what's everyone doing. Right. So I went there and looked at what everyone was doing more or less and said, okay, what's missing? What can we do different? Because – Listen, I I can't compete with CBR on getting news out. That's not going to happen. They have they have dedicated people whose jobs it is to hit that refresh button, get those uh, press releases, write them up real quick, and send them out the door to their millions of social media followers across Twitter and Facebook and everything. I have to work during the day, so I can't I can't do that. Yeah. I can't compete on previews. I can't compete on big announcements because it it doesn't make sense for any publisher to work with anyone except for some of the top, you know, three or four people. And that's fine. And I accept that. So we wanted to say, okay, well, we can do good content. We we think we're funny to each other as a team, so we can probably do some humor content. We know we have a lot of talent. Uh, we have multiple uh professors at prestigious universities on our writing staff. Mm -hmm. uh, we have multiple people who uh, just do incredibly good work for other sites, Eisner winners, all this stuff of people who are good at their jobs. So we said, what can you write for us? That's good. What are you passionate about? What do you care about? Let's get that out. Cause I can chase clicks all day, right? But I'm not going to I'm not going to win that if I can if I can grow connections with people, make it feel a lot easier to say want to support us or something like that, then that's going to help us grow, help us, you know, help us hit that cash register, get our uh, writers paid, help us keep going and help us put out cool stuff in the world. So we wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. We have we have a few columns that like are 
pretty typical and we're going to make sure that those get out and get out early because they're going to drive eyeballs to the site it turns out when ten of swords comes out uh then we are going to be the first people with the first article on that uh to drive you know any traffic but you know there's people who aren't going to care about what the latest thing that aftershock or vault are doing unless we give them a reason to care right and we found that hey, we can uh, we can highlight some of that stuff and do it in very interesting and cool ways, and try and get some more eyes on stuff. So it was it was really building that personal connection. We you know finding a community. We've we have weekly Zoom calls with our writers where we just all hang out, uh, and we liked that, and we wanted to expand that and bring that sense into the world because you know I I know there are a bunch of the let's call them medium tier comic sites. And I, I feel comfortable saying that because I have a tiering system now. <laughs> uh, it's fine. I just, I just, I just do uh, SEO analysis on stuff and figure out where everyone falls. And I have all the data and it's uh, great for my type a mind to have a hard number in front of it. Yo, everybody, I want to take a quick second to give a shout out to my friends at Bad Idea. You may have heard of this experimental new comic book publisher. They're the crew that's debuting in select comic shops worldwide on March 3rd, 2021 with Matt Kent and Doug Braithwaite's ENIAC number one. And they're doing so a little bit differently than their peers. First, each issue is oversized and ad free. Second, each issue comes with a bonus B-side story, giving readers a little something extra with each issue. Lastly, and this is the wild part, so listen up. They don't publish variants, trades, or digital versions of their comics, so if you want one or all of them, you better get to the Bad Idea retailer near you and be there on a Wednesday. Don't have one near you? Pre-order online or explore your options for mail order at badideacorp.com to make sure you don't miss out on any act or upcoming titles from creators like Zeb Wells, David LaFuente, Marguerite Bennett, and many more. And now, back to the show. I just want to say I'm simultaneously horrified to find out where Sketch falls. And also, I realize it's not that big of a deal because my like structure is completely different. But it is. Yeah, yeah. You know, it makes sense. I mean, Your you... structure is both completely different. And, hey, David, you're doing, you're doing pretty good for a uh, for a pay subscription site. It, it's doing pretty well. It's, I mean, it, it definitely – this week helped. Let's just say that. But uh, – that was that was a lot. That was a very <laughs> long article about Secret Wars. It was a very long uh, article. It turned out – People when when Hickman talks, people listen. So th- that's actually let me take that back. First thing when we said we were going to do a new side, I said, "Hey, can we finally get Hickman to talk to us?" And you did. Uh, we did. That that was the I had been pitching him stuff for a while, and he's notoriously shy, and that's fine and good for him. Uh, the pitch that finally worked was saying, "Hey, John, I don't want to talk about any of your comics. Do you want to talk about charts?" And he said, "Yes, absolutely. I would love to do that. Thank you." That's awesome. Well, okay. it was. So it's beautiful. I, I do want to say that, like, okay, so I've I've always found it odd that when new sites come up, new comic sites come up, that so many of them fall into the same news, previews, reviews, like, template. Like, it's just, like, that's kind of what it is. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But it's just, like, it, like you said, it's tough to compete with others by doing the same thing as everyone else does. What's your niche there? If you if you don't have the funding to hire a content writer to actually, you know, get your SEO in front of people, if you can't rise up those rankings, then you're not going to get the discoverability that you really want right. just by doing the same thing as everybody else. If you look at like comicbook.com, for example, they were able to shoot up because they had the funding to do it, you know, to be a more, you know, relatively new site. Uh Versus, you know, some of the older sites like a CBR that's been around for a million how years. long at this point. But if you're just going to do the same thing as everybody else, why are you doing it? I don't, I don't understand that personally. I, I know what I can expect from some other sites, and I've always found that hey, if you've got a niche, you're going to find an audience that cares about that niche, and if you can grow that audience with you and expand little by little. You're going to have a lot more success than saying, we're going to do everything now. Yeah. We're just going to be everything to everyone. And it's, it's weird. I get, I get asked by a lot of people, uh, you know, check out, check out this new podcast I'm doing all this stuff or check out this new thing, or I want to, I want to write for you and all this stuff. And the first thing I ask every single time is 
What's your pitch? What's your niche? What are you doing different? And if you can answer that question, even if it's not a good answer, you're already on the right track. Yeah. If your answer is, well, I just really, I really liked, I really liked reading this review. So now I want to write reviews just like that. That review already exists. You're someone's already doing that. And maybe you can do it better, but maybe you can't. And maybe it's going to be easier for you to get noticed if you do something different. Yeah. Well, I mean, I do want to say that I think that you, what you pitched Tickman on is a good example of like the importance of differentiation, whether you're talking about creators. I mean, here's another thing is like it's a lot easier to sell like, a you know, somebody who works in marketing at a comic publisher or like one of the independent ones. If you have an angle that separates you from everybody else, mm -hmm. it's really tough to say, hey, I'm just going to be doing, you know, the same reviews, previews, news cycle. And like them want to work with wanting to work with you. I mean, I say that as a person who works with basically zero of like the publishers whatsoever. But but I mean, I which I I think I might have differentiated myself too much, which is a problem. But at the same time, here's another good example. I was going to bring this up specifically. It's partially a joke, but it's also not. I really like the witch mutant is which crave both Taco Bell menu item you guys did. Like that was okay. That's great. That that was, and I am not making this up that was us doing a very dumb thread on our slack and then me popping in and said you guys are idiots can you just write this down yeah can we can we please put this on the website and uh vishal gulapali uh jumped in there and said yeah i'll do that and it's it's one of my favorite pieces because that that week we had like two p two pitches that went out one was that and one was i'm forgetting exactly who but it oh no i believe it was a. Uh, it was a deep uh, examination of one of our writers uh, and his feelings on his Jewish identity as compared to, uh, you know, how Kitty Pride, Kate Pride right. has been shown in comics during uh, Marauder specifically. Uh, there was a whole arc about her reclaiming her life. And part of that was reclaiming her Jewish identity, you know, at least visually. Uh, in certain aspects by wearing, you know, the Star of David and getting her good, good curly hair back. Mm -hmm. And that resonated with him. And that week hit me so hard because I said, oh, those are our two, those are our two competing interests, our yin and yang. It's this real deep emotional, like human personal story that is at the crossroads of comics. And this other one is an incredibly dumb, bad joke yes. that we're going to take too far. I have a lot of thoughts about the dumb bad joke. Are you okay with listening to them? I am. I am perfectly okay with listening to thoughts about dumb bad jokes. Okay. First no off, one. No one has ever been upset about listening to people talk about a joke. Oh, my wife. My wife is. Has, I've put comments. See, I, there's. Oh there, my god. We talk about that joke. Don't. There's don't. So there, many jokes we could talk about, David. Oh my god. When I was I was having a comic book garage sale a couple summers ago, and this one guy was hanging out, and I said my wife, like, because she was like going in and getting something. I was like, I have right. to wait for As my wife. As a married man, it's a it's. Two words you say frequently. Yes, yes. And so the guy was just like, did you mean? I was like, what do you mean? And he's, he just kept nudging like towards me. And I was like, my wife. And he's like, and he said, very nice. And I was just like, what is happening right now? This was like way before Borat too. So it was like in that area where Borat was definitely in the low levels. But okay, dumb thoughts really quick. First off, I just want to say, um, it was Vishal? Yes. Vish Vishal's Mexican pizza take is bad. Mexican pizzas are underrated. I actually think they're not that bad. Also, Chalupas, way better than Bishop. And I do want to say, I actually think a better fit for Bishop is uh, Cable and Nate Gray as the Naked Chicken Chalupa. Although, I do understand that Vishal's take was basically a setup for making a joke about post-Messiah complex Bishop. Yes, um, yes. Sometimes we do bits just to make other jokes. It's oh, yeah. It's, it was totally a setup. I mean, it, and it works really well. I totally get the logic behind it. But when I was reading it. It was funny. I was like on a walk last night and I was thinking about it. And I was just like, man, I think Cable's a better answer with Nate Gray being the naked chicken chalupa. And I was like, I got to bring this up. I'm like, why does my brain work like this? People debate in comments, which I tell myself I will never read and then always do. Uh, so many things that we say. I'm not sure there was a lot of debate about the naked chicken chalupa, but you're bringing it back, and I appreciate that. Oh, I'm bringing it back. I'll bring it back. I, I figured I could get you on my side by saying X-Man is the one that's bad, but I don't actually believe that. I like X-Man. That is a digression we cannot get into, though. No, David, I'm looking at three 
hard custom hardcover copies of the entire 75 issue run of X-Man that I was sent mysteriously in the mail one day. Uh, and I have a lot of feelings about Nate Gray, the X-Man, and we cannot get into that. No, no, that's a different podcast. That's that's just like that's a lifestyle at that point, an opposite of a lifestyle. But I do think it's interesting, though, because. All of this, all of this, what we're talking about, it sounds like a joke, but honestly, like, that's the stuff that differentiates you. Like, having, because, like, you mentioned the conversational stuff, and I think that that's a really important difference. Like, when I was at Multiversity, that was one of the things we did with this mm-hmm. one, um, uh, this one column we called Mignolaversity, which was just, we would have discussion reviews of things involving, um, Mike Mignola comics, Hellboy, BPRD, et cetera, et cetera. And there was like little things that became like personality elements that people remembered us for. And and I think that's interesting because like I was going to ask you like where you viewed opportunity content wise and engagement wise. But it seems to me that a lot of it is is like this sounds more craven than I mean, but I think you're going to know what I'm saying. It seems like the opportunity is less in content or engagement. It's just like trusting the personalities, trusting the people that you have on your staff and just letting them do their thing and not trying to put them in a box. It It's a lot of that. And the reason why I know that works is because it builds connections and I can look at the, I can look at the analytics and say that, you know, even if our total number of visits are not crazy, our ratio of unique visits to, you know, total visits is pretty good, which means that even if the audience is not huge, you've got a lot of people who are dedicated consumers and fans of the stuff that we're doing. They are going to share it. They are going to continue to come back to it and they are finding it. And for a site like ours that like, I'm not, if someone wants to buy the site for me, fine, cool. I'll sell out in a heartbeat, but I don't have any expectation of that. So what's my end game here? It's, it's essentially to have fun, grow our it's have fun. And if we can grow our Patreon support and shoot that over to my writers so that they can get paid for the good stuff that they're doing. Yeah. And that's it. And the best way to do that is to get people to care about you. Yeah. Like I, I've, I did an experiment early, early on in the site uh, where I had a Patreon and it was the difference the difference between having the Patreon and then having the Patreon when we started the podcast and people could hear mine and Adam's voice Mm -hmm. and understand like, oh, these are real people. That human connection, that grows so much engagement. I don't like if I'm I'm not going to name names, but if I look at a random comic site that does a bunch of reviews, I don't know anything about them. I they're they're a generic faceless void to me that is writing words about uh I don't know, Excalibur, since that's the thing that just scrolled past me. Why should I why should I feel any connection to that? That's just content out there where, you know, if you feel a relationship to something, you're going to be so much more willing to open up your hearts and your pocketbook and say, hey, I want to support this because I I trust you and I like you. Right. I mean, it's. I think you know podcasting in general, but also you know a lot of like really great sites are built off of that idea of parasocial relationships, and and I don't mean that in a demeaning way to the people that 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 are are fans, but it's like you listen, you know, people who listen to podcasts often say things like when they're listening to it, it's like they're listening to their friend have a conversation, and. I think that that's I think that's a powerful thing. Like I like uh, I don't know if you ever listen to the podcast Binge Mode, but I'm a big fan of the podcast Binge Mode. And it's like you listen to them and it's like you start recognizing like trends in their interests and stuff. And you kind of you, you start realizing you're just like, oh, I know what this person's going to say because you've been listening to them for so long. Talk about this subject. Just like I imagine people are listening to, you know, you and Adam talk about something on Battle of the Atom. And I bet they could specifically be like if you bring up some specific comic that you're going to rank. People probably were like, oh, man, I got to listen to this one because I know what they're going to say about this. And they're probably right. That's I mean, part of that's the hope. I know I I'm a big podcast listener. I understand the power of those parasocial relationships, even, you know, even if it's not great. I know that I've been in a room with a bunch of fans of my brother, my brother and me and understanding, oh, these people are very into this podcast and really like these people. Uh, but it it built community and built a lot of people who assumed that they were closer to people than they might have been. 
And that's that can sometimes be the negative side of it. But the positive side is, oh, my gosh, look at all of this raw energy that you have in one direction. What can you what can happen if you can channel that into something cool? What can happen if you take all of that, you know, trust and all that? Hey, we like you and we trust you and we value your opinion and throw that behind like a Kickstarter for a comic that you really believe in or pass that into you know someone's new book that you think needs a second uh, shot to actually uh, you know really make an impact in the market that's something that we absolutely believe in and i i encourage my team to say hey if you believe in a book if you have something to say about it write it we'll put it up because we we want to push that stuff i love it yeah i mean i think foundationally your site is built on that idea like that that whole idea i mean foundationally your site is built on people sharing a passion in one subject, the X-Men, and then expanding and, from there. And I, there's there's one very important distinction that I feel the need to make on that, and that is that doesn't mean we are uncritical. Oh, yeah, sure. We, there, there, is, there is a bad habit in, a, you know, especially reviews for comics, because here's the thing that people may not understand about the review ecosystem. Big sites don't do it that much anymore. There's, it's not a it's not a traffic draw no for them if you look you know comicbook.com does one big review of a handful of capsule stuff every uh every week and i know some of the writers who do that and they do it because it's a passion project of theirs uh if you look at news rama or cbr they barely throw out you know what you you know traditional reviews that you used to think of so you end up having a lot of the mid-tier and small sites who are doing them and I, I hate to say it, but a lot of those sites do not put the same level of criticality towards a work that, you know, I would expect or that I was you know used to seeing from reviewers. And I, I think that's unfortunate because you should be willing to look at a book and say it has flaws. If everything is a perfect 10 out of 10, then what are you doing? You're, you're not adding to the conversation you're just writing words out there you are not making something new out of it there's a uh, there was a thread that went around on twitter today and it was some critic who i don't know saying dumb stuff about how critics do more than a, a creator which is stupid and is a you know is just a pissing contest that no one should be involved in right and all it got me thinking is no writing a criticism is different than creation you are making a new thing based on something else so you want that thing to be as good and as additive to the work that you are critiquing as possible if you write a review that said my favorite character did a really cool strong thing and i thought the art by artist i guess uh was pretty neat that's nothing right that is that is a twitter post and it's fine to have nonsense thoughts like that but that's not that's not what the comic book industry needs. That's mm -hmm. not going to help build relationships. That's just you saying, hey, I like this and I like getting review copies and I like to continue getting review copies. And your review copies aren't actually at risk, people. You can say dumb stuff all the time as long as you're fair. I don't know, man. I am like a good – I don't get review copies. You should get – you should get review copies. Ah. You wouldn't do you 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 don't read digital to begin with. Don't even give me. That I mean, I minute. could though if I had them. <laughs> Yo, everybody. I want to take a quick second to give a shout out to my friends at Macroverse. Macroverse is an exciting digital comics platform featuring top creators from all parts of the comics, webtoon, and storytelling universe with everything curated for quality. Think of it kind of like uh, HBO for comics. There's over 35 series and more than 400 episodes so far with work from creators like Brian Stelfreeze, Juan Doe, Paul Shear, and more with each using Macroverse's unique tap story format, which tells comic stories at the power of a tap that's only possible in a digital format. Check out Macroverse today by downloading the app on iOS or Google Play. The first episode of every series is free, with unlimited access to this growing library being just $4.99 a month. And now, back to the show. I do, you know, it is interesting because I think that you know, the idea of a comic site has been in need of a refresh to a certain degree for a while. So I appreciate that that approach. I am interested in that. We, we kind of talked about this offline. Well, uh, online, but just not on this line. Uh, how much do you feel like you needed to reframe the understanding of what the site is once this change was made? Because it's, you know, part of it, 
I mean, for for you all, I mean, you guys, you you've been doing non X Men stuff for a while now, and so the the rebrand was more about external. I imagine it's about helping people better understand that this is not this ain't your father's X Xavier Files. This is this is a new thing. Was that an important thing for you to do? That was the key thing to do. Legitimately, we knew what we were doing, and we were really happy with the content that we were putting out. We uh. We had started with the X-Men stuff, moved into more Marvel because, well, we had access to their PR team and that was easy enough to make the transition. And we started working with a buddy of mine, Dan Grote, who ran WMQ Comics, which was a small site. Dan's a newspaper editor as trade, so he's very smart, has some real uh, talented people that were working with him, including Will Nevin, who you mentioned earlier. Uh, and I talked to him and said, Dan, you, you're already doing this. You want to just do it together and we can do fun stuff. And that was, that was over the summer. So for about six months, we were putting out all of this and really enjoying it and really being happy with it. But because the audience that I had built through social media over the last little bit and like it or not, social media is the number one driver of traffic for sites of this size. Mm -hmm. Once you, once you get big enough to hit the SEO stuff, to get on the Google trends, uh, then it then that takes over everything. And every time we've been lucky enough to do that, I could I look at the data, I see the big spikes. I know what we try to hit. But the social media audience that we had built, because we started at it as a niche product, was super distilled at that niche. Mm -hmm. We could we struggled to push it. I know there was a book, uh, No One's Rose, that came out that I really loved. And that was before we had figured out, you know, that we could just do whatever. And I was thinking the whole time, well, how can I write an article about this that is related to X-Men and that will get X-Men fans to <laughs> click on it? It was like, hey, Zach, uh, I really, Zach, I say Zach, Zach Thompson, the writer, uh, along with Emily Horn and Alberto Albuquerque, uh, who does absolutely exceptional art on it. Uh, I was just trying to think, how can I, how can I get people to hear about their book? Uh, I'll just tie it to X Men, I guess. I'll just I'll just say it's really close to Hawks Pox. Mm -hmm. uh, it has it has a lot of superficial elements to it, and that really worked. And that got me thinking. Well, wait, we can just we just got to figure out how to grow the audience. Well, the audience is going to see our logo having a big old X in it and see the name Xavier and be like, oh, well, this is a Twitter account about uh, the X Men, and that's not wrong, but it's different now. Yeah, and we said. Let's let's do a full rebrand. So we changed the URL, changed all of our social media stuff, changed all of our uh, outward branding uh, in terms of logos and all this, changed the look and feel of the website. So there's there's people who, you know, if they missed what the site was, they missed all of the announcements that we tried to roll out over a month that was way too long to tease something. Uh, they were they were going to. Uh, not even have any idea it was us until they saw the content. It's like, okay, this is good. Mm -hmm. And just try and do a refresh then because we had, we had grown as large as our niche was going to allow us. Mm -hmm. We just, we weren't going to hit that next level and we weren't going to be able to properly get eyeballs on the stuff we want eyeballs on. I'm sure there's people who follow the, follow the site now that don't care about X-Men. But they're like, man, I really love Daredevil or I really love We Only Find Them When They're Dead uh, or some of the other stuff that we like to cover. And that's that's what it hits for them. And they said, OK, let's let's follow this. And my hope is that it'll help. And I, I can look at the numbers and I know it's helped. Uh, I can see the growth that we've had. I can see the increase in terms of patronage i can see the increase in terms of social media in terms of clicks all that stuff so i know it's working and we've we've been cxf for at this point not even a month and i'm very excited to see what this next year brings in terms of that because i i don't think we have anywhere to go but up yeah i uh okay so I, i'm just gonna see if, i'm gonna play guessing game with you i linked uh -oh. to an article off of your site tomorrow in my 10 things column uh oh. Which one do you think it is? Uh, is it the one about the the convention in New Jersey? It is. Yeah, that's wild. Let me let me let me talk about that for a second. Uh, and only because it's stupid that anyone's doing a convention, and 
I did have to end up using that article in my day job, which is in HVAC. Sure. To talk about air purification systems. Yeah. And the because important the, need of them in a comic convention during a pandemic. Well, the, so the reason why is some of the technology that they specifically called out, I had to yell at my uh, my team and say, look, they're actually like this idiot who's trying to run a comic convention in the middle of a pandemic knows about this technology and he shouldn't ever care about his HVAC system. Oh, he needs to care now. Oh, he needs to care now, but. He shouldn't normally. Yeah, yeah. I well, well just it's, for, it's for good. Quick, really quick for listeners that don't know, it's an article Dan Grote did where he interviewed, I think it was Dave O'Hare, who is the person who one of the, the co showrunner for the oh my god Garden State Comics Fest in New Jersey, who is running from the which is running from the 29th to the 31st, and it, you know I, I I thought it was a really good piece by Dan because it helps explain like the rationale that person shared with with Dan. I can see the logic behind it. Do I think it's a good idea? No. I can see the rationale and I can see that they're putting work in there to try to deny its inherent super spreader like nature. Sure. But they're, they're taking precautions. It's a fascinating piece. Yeah. It's it's very uh it's very exciting to see stuff that like I wouldn't have done that a year ago. I wouldn't have written that. I wouldn't have felt qualified to write about that. But because we bring in people from a diverse background in terms of their experience, in terms of their identity, uh, we are we are able to write pieces that I never could. And that brings me so much joy yeah. to be able to to be able to push that kind of stuff out there. We have a we we have a very, very queer uh writing group. Mm-hmm. Uh which wasn't intentional. It's just one day I was looking at our staff and I realized that half of them were, you know, gay, trans, lesbian, bisexual, uh, non-binary. And I looked around and said, son of a bitch, really? This just happened? This is great. But yeah. it, it came up organically. And for me, I mean, I'm, I'm another cis straight white dude talking about comics. I'm, I'm the voice that there's a billion of already. So the ability to uplift other voices that, you know, have other opinions, that's, that's something that really means a lot to me. We've got, we've got a writer, uh, Jude Jones, who he's a, he works in uh, Washington, DC. He's fantastic, fantastic guy. Uh, And he wrote a piece after the uh, insurrection stuff. Because he was there, he was he was on our chat that morning saying, "Hey, yeah, uh, DC's really weird right now." Yeah, and something something's happening, uh, and we were like, "Okay, stay stay safe." And he wrote he wrote an incredibly beautiful piece that tied you know that related those attacks back to uh, actually Tana Hesse Coates uh, Captain America run, which opens with a insurrection by white American uh, supremists uh, on the Capitol. I was going to say, I think it's a lot of nukes, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lot of it's a lot of nukes, which <laughs> nuke is he's a Frank Miller character. He's not subtle. No, no. <laughs> he has an American flag tattooed on his face and he really cares about the troops. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I was going to say, doesn't he say, was it for the boys or for the troops? My boys. The boys. The boys. The oh, yeah. boys. They left the boys. Oh, my God. Which, which is an indictment of Vietnam and definitely worth criticizing, but also is a very funny thing to just say constantly when you have a American flag tattooed on your face. Yes, very much so. What a character. Oh, man. Born Again, one of my – actually, probably my favorite Marvel comic ever, and Nuke is just an absolute maniac in it. Ultimate wow, maniac. So good. Dropped like a – well, dropped like a nuke into Hell's Kitchen, but I do – okay, well, one thing I want to bring up really quick – before we, I want to, we're going to close with some X Men stuff, but I did want to bring up one thing. I I've long thought that the answer to people are always like, oh, how do we make a new bigger comic site happen? And I always thought that one of the smarter answer, or one of the better answers to it, if if you could make it work, was merging smaller sites, and you did that. And I think that that's really smart. I, I am interested in. So you said basically you just were talking with Dan, and it was just like bringing that together. But I mean, is that something you've looked at in general, or is is it really just something that happened organically? It's something we had thought about for sure, especially when we were looking to develop coverage. Like I said, this isn't this isn't my day job, so 
the the only the only way that I could grow and do more is to bring on other people. And I said, well, we could we could try and then grow that organically and build that up with our staff who at the time were completely unpaid volunteers. Or we could do a bolt-on acquisition of a different site. And Dan, uh, Dan and me were friends of friends. We we knew each other from the same circles, but you know we we weren't close or anything like that. Uh, but we had both respected each other's work for a while and just started talking about it. And I think it's a it's a good way to get that going. But I think the biggest the biggest thing that's missing from starting a new site and the biggest thing that's stopping us from growing at a rate that I think is justified to the uh, quality of work that we do is capital. That's people talk about comics Alliance. Like it was this great thing. Uh, comics Alliance had money. People don't remember how much money they had. They were like AOL started it. And then it, you know, went around to a couple of different investors, but they had capital to get stuff out there. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the biggest sites, Games Radar uh, bought out Newsrama. Polygon is an entertainment site that has a great comics editor, uh, but you know also has money behind it. CBR got bought out. Comic Book is owned by people. Bleeding Cool. I think it's owned by CBS, around. isn't it? They are. They are owned by CBS. Uh, CBR is owned by Valnet. Uh, Polygon is owned by Vox. Mm -hmm. uh, Games Radar owns Newsrama. Uh, but like even you look down, Bleeding Cool Avatar. is owned by Avatar. Yep. The beat, which was probably like the the smallest big site or the biggest small site, depending on how you want to look at it, until very recently were owned by Oni or no Lineforge, Lineforge. excuse me. Uh, well, I guess so whatever the uh, money, the other uh, offshoot of Lineforge is, but yeah, right. That money matters mm -hmm. to getting stuff done. So in lieu of you know hedge fund managers coming in and saying Zachary, here's a bag of money. Give me the keys to your comic book website, which I would take. That sounds pretty good. And if you are listening, I would take a very small amount for that. But in lieu of that, you got to bring in talent and you got to bring in people and you got to bring in people from different places. Now we've talked about acquisitions and that's, that's such a corporate headhunter word for this dumb comic book website where we talk about if Wolverine is like a taco or a burrito more, uh, I feel like team up is a, is a more adequate word. It it is, but you know, bring bring a lot of people under one roof and saying, "Hey, we are going to get big that way because the amount of content you put out increases your engagement. It increases the amount of times that someone is seeing your site. It increases how much they go to it. When you put out one article a week." You know, you're only going to grow so much because you're only going to get eyeballs at that time. If you continue to have stuff constantly, 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 you get that out. And it's a balance between having a lot of content and, you know, perhaps too much content and trashy, clickbaity, you know, all that stuff that people hate about comic book websites versus having good stuff. Yeah, there, there's like a level in the middle that you need where it's like volume mixed with quality. I mean, if, if you're quality going that takes route. Time is the thing, though. That's the biggest thing. If quality takes time and you don't got the money to pay people to do it full time, yeah, then you have to bring in more people who can take the time to put the quality out so that you can increase your total output of articles. And it's so annoying to <laughs> think about that stuff in like cold business school sense. But if your goal is growth, that's how you have to attack these things because – the internet is a massive place. And even, even in comics, we are a medium sized fish in a tiny pond. We are, we are lucky enough to have an audience, uh, but we're, we're not the big ones. We are, we can just hit the niche that we have. So if you, if you want to be bigger, you got to expand in yeah. some way or another. Did you think about going with ads? Yes, uh, we we are going to get to ads. We've done some uh, like A/B testing and stuff, uh, but yeah, one ads look bad. Yeah, and and two, I I know what I know what our impressions would be. I can rough out what our click through rate would be, and I know what I know what the payout would be for you know someone's ad dollars. We just 
maybe maybe we could break a hundred dollars, maybe two hundred dollars a month, but that's not gonna that's not gonna be it's a, a paradigm. It's a bad yet. model. It's a, I, I'm not I you know even working in digital media, I'm 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 not a big advocate for it. After we talk, remind me to bring up fan graphs. That that is unrelated to this, but uh, we'll we'll jump into that later. Well, let's let's close with some X Men stuff because I I okay. do I do want to close with a little bit about that. You know, in, in lieu of jumping into the totality of the state of the X books as I originally planned, let's focus on the current X Men election that's going on, where yep. the uh, the X Men books are having an election for. All of the, you know, the team that will be the new X-Men team. And the final spot is going to be decided by fans, which is a very lovely change of pace in the history of comic-based voting, which is either based on, you know, who's going to win a fight or whether or not Jason Todd's going to die. Which is beautiful. It's it's a big old nerd in Jonathan Hickman wanting to do a Legion of Superheroes election. Yeah. And saying, I'm going to do that in my X-Men book now and you can't stop me because it sells pretty well. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's really smart though because it's it's leveraging the heat and energy and passion that X Men fans have for. And I, as as I phrase this in in my column tomorrow, I don't mean this in a diminishing fashion. By and large, B list characters, uh, like most of the characters. Oh, B list at least. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. These I, are I mean, not these are not heavy hitters. No, no. Th- this isn't like Wolverine and Cyclops and Jean Grey. This is like uh, you know, Boom Boom, who I love. Believe me. But there's a reason why she was a next wave. But um, anyways, so I, I'm curious as to your I mean, like, I find it to be such a fascinating exercise and it seems to be working in the exact way that they wanted to. What are your thoughts on it? OK, I have a lot of thoughts on this. Oh, yeah, I'm sure I have a lot of thoughts on this one. I love the idea. The X-Men fans are absolutely rabid. And you can either be di- terrified of that, which a lot of people are, and they rightly should be because X-Men fans sometimes don't understand boundaries or how storytelling works or how to wait for the next issue on things. They're terrible at that. But they're also really good at tweets. <laughs> they are incredibly good at using Twitter. So and being enthusiastic you, in general. Yo, they're... It's a it's a ball of energy. And if you can direct that into something, that's incredibly good. The the friggin' hashtag for that thing was number two trending in the world mm-hmm. when when it was announced. Like you don't get that kind of attention on comics. Now, did many of the people know it was for comics? No, and that's not the point. I wish I wish that many people were uh reading the X books, and I feel like they could have done a better job uh telling people where they will find out the results, you know, like how they can get in on the story right now and how they could parlay all of that good attention in, instead of general talking about X-Men into reading the books that are out that are by and large the best that the X-Men line has ever been. Like I think pound for pound, there there's going to be more than one book you love. And that's, that's a big thing when, just a few years ago, it was, there may be a book that you like. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's great. I think pulling in smaller characters uh, like Mero and Strong Guy and Tempo is great. What I don't like is because it was pushed and maybe not uh, communicated to be about the comics and all this stuff. There's a lot of... There's a lot of people that are really excited about the show The Gifted, which wasn't even the best X-Men show when it was coming out by a long shot. Right. And they are very excited that if they vote for uh, Polaris, who is already living her best life and being written probably better than she's ever been in uh, X-Factor, they're voting for her. And I don't like that. We've only got the day one results, uh, which Glob Herman is uh, (laughs) delivering, which... Professor Glob. Respect the man. They... As as a as a resident Glob Herman expert, I can tell you they used new art for that. They commissioned someone to draw a new Glob for that. They did not just Photoshop a tie on him. I love it. It's so beautiful. I love that so much. Uh, but you know, we saw the first results, and unfortunately, number one, number two is Polaris and Banshee, who are probably the ones with the biggest uh, 
Highest pull awareness. in terms of, yeah, just Banshee was on in giant size. Polaris has been there since the Silver Age, and she's Magneto's daughter. And wouldn't you know it, his other sometimes daughter has a TV show right now that my five-year-old really likes. So there's a lot of hype between that. And there's a lot of, I mean this very uh, kindly, but a lot of casual fans who maybe they read a Wikipedia summary or watch a YouTube video about a superhero and don't go any farther than that. And that's fine. If that's the level they want to engage, they are like, Oh, Magneto's kid. Yes. X-Men. And I'm like, but she has bones that stick out of her. (laughs) So is, is that set um, revealing who you voted for? Uh, It's revealing who I definitely voted for only once. Yes. Oh, that seems extremely unconvincing are you starting like a fiverr campaign where you're getting people paying people to vote for this i mean listen let's 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 not go into details but (laughs) i feel like i feel like so if if covid didn't happen this campaign would be going on in november right so i feel like thematically uh if you give people an internet poll do you expect to get perfect results i don't know I don't trust the internet very much. They're very smart and very able to manipulate things. But I think that no matter what the result is, uh, it'll be it'll be very interesting to see what happens. It's a fun cast. And I, I love that someone like Hickman, who is notorious for being a planner, for being so you know precise about things and has built a mythology around how detailed he is, whether that's true or not, is taking one of the most commercially successful lines in comics and throwing a giant wrench in it just to see what happens. Yeah. I think that's incredible. And I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for where that goes. X-Men's it's a good time to be an X-Men fan. I'm not going to lie. You know, I'm interested. I, I don't know if you know the story behind this, but like, do you remember the DC versus Marvel like crossover that they had, wh- which eventually resulted in Amalgam and all that? I know of it by reputation. Okay. Uh, I've not read the actual crossover. I have read a handful of Amalgam books, and I do know that uh, the reason that Professor X is crippled in the, or not Professor X, excuse me, Magneto is crippled in the uh, Days of Future Past storyline is that the character Access, who came out of Amalgam, uh, accidentally caused that. So it's it's DC's fault for that story, which is incredible. What, what they did with those is they had, uh, in each of uh, in the issues, they had all the fights. They had like Wolverine versus right. Lobo and Storm versus... And you voted Wolverine. on them, right? And you voted on them, exactly. The amazing thing is, and like this is just how they had to do it, is they... they put they com- they created both sections like if if lobo won those pages exist if wolverine won those pages exist etc cetera, etc cetera. every single every single possible result was covered and drawn and and taken care of and i do wonder if hickman has plans depending on who wins so, like that would be interesting so what i can tell you uh because i'm i am close enough with some of the writers in that room uh who you know, just sometimes say how things happen, but do not give spoilers on things. I can say pretty, pretty explicitly that it was a group effort of everybody to come together with this. And they all have ideas about, okay, well, if this happens, then what do we do? I don't think, I think this is early enough that they, they aren't pages drawn. There's a reason why uh, we're going straight into this story about uh, unlocking the vault and the Mike Carey run coming back. Yeah. Uh, But I didn't mean that they had pages drawn, but I mean, I wonder no. if, because, oh, I'm sure, I'm sure they've, they've thought through it because this has impacts on more than just X-Men. Right. Not all of these characters are just sitting around. Forge is a major player in X-Force. Polaris is arguably the lead in X-Factor. Uh, Armors in she- or Sword, excuse me, not Shield. I keep, I, yeah, Sword. She is the Shield of Sword. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of these characters that, are doing stuff right now. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with it. There's some things that I hope don't happen. I'm on team. I will not vote for Lorna and no one should vote for Lorna because uh, I love X factor. It's one of my favorite books. Uh, I'm incredibly biased. Lee is a good friend, uh, but I, I legitimately think it's a incredible title that's coming out and I don't want to lose that because I'm selfish and I want to enjoy the book that I'm already enjoying. Yeah. And I, I agree with you because it's, 
losing that version i mean i i'm not saying that the character would necessarily disappear from x factor if that happened but her thread being the prime well i, I think you know it, 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 the only other one you could say that is the lead would be north star and and i would say that it's probably more especially in the, the last issue it definitely lean more towards lorna and i think losing that that spot for the character to make Lorna a like you know uh, you know let's say maybe a not the main X Men but on the main X Men team right I I just I don't know that 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 to me feels like a loss and it, meanwhile like I mean honestly like I voted for Sunspot you actually convinced me that I made a mistake by doing that so I guess I'm gonna have to go on Fiverr and create my own campaign but I I have a I, I think there are cases being made for Maggot Boom Boom and Tempo that would be really interesting I would love to see what Hickman would do with Tempo that'd be wild I would Tempo Here's the thing. I'm an apologist for the Fabian Nicieza, uh, Greg Capullo X Force, mm-hmm. and Tempo does not get a lot of scenes in there. But when she shows up, she's absolutely fascinating because she's a member of the Mutant Liberation Front, right. which is a radical, uh, sometimes terrorist organization. Uh, but she like legitimately believes in their mission. Is the thing like she's not there to do bad things she's there because to her this is the x-men this is what she can do to help mutants Mm -hmm. and that's so cool and i'd love to see an underdeveloped character like that get the same treatment that hickman gave to say smasher Mm -hmm. in his uh in his avengers uh he gave a refresh to shang chi uh stuff like what he did with uh uh what's his name dragon man the dragon man oh yeah fantastic four hell yeah like He's incredibly good at taking these bit parts and giving them a real push. And I don't think Lorna Dane needs that right now. I think that like Cannonball and Sunspot, I think Hickman writes them great. I think I've seen Hickman write them in a ton of comics and I'd love to see what he does with someone else because I bet it would be interesting and cool. And at this point, all I care about in X-Men is not like my favorite character showing up or, you know, them not being hated and feared. I just want to see something cool because there's so much opportunity in this story engine that is Krakoa to let people do cool stuff all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Also think about the power set. Tempo's power set's cool. And like Tempo's- time stuff, ooh, it's gonna be interesting. Especially when it's once they start combining powers like they are in New Mutants. Oh man. I mean I'm just imagining Mahmoud Asar. Uh, drawing, drawing some weird time freezing stuff, and mm, it would be so good. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm excited for that. I, I'm very excited for that as well. Okay, well, last question for you. I, you know, one thing I was thinking about involving Comics XF is that you know, your heart, you you, you love the X Men. You're you, you're you're a huge fan of it. It's it's in the roots of the X Men. Do you think that that will always be in the roots of comics XF or do you view it as something that will just keep evolving and maybe not be as big of a part going forward? I see it being minimized only because we aren't growing there. Like not in terms of numbers, numbers do fine, but in terms of the content that we put out, there's only so much X Men stuff. And it's a super served audience. It is. It's served. It's the hottest. It's the hottest thing in comics. Like for the people that X Men fans are weird in that they will want to read everything. Where like like King and Black, for example, big event. Donny Cates is, you know, he is the rock star of comics right now. Good for him. But those those kind of stuff like that that's got a Venom fan that's going to read the comic and say this is super sweet, but not going to be like reaching out for any shred of information about King and black. Mm -hmm. That's, that's just, it's a different profile. So the X-Men fans are already served by all the sites going after that stuff. And, you know, we've got our core audience. We're great with that, but there's, there's other audiences that are underserved and we'd love to see that there's, there's some indie stuff that we feel passionate about, uh, like Giga, for example, that's coming out of uh, vault. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's, uh, Alex Packnadel and I am forgetting the John artist's Lee. name. John Lee. Yes. Uh, we've got we've got writers who absolutely love that. We want to, like, every time that comes out, we want it to be a big deal. Because sometimes on the internet, if you pretend something's real, like the stock market, it becomes real. Man, I've been trying with Kaiju Max <laughs> for like six years. and <laughs> Come on, people. Hey, GameStop. Hey, here's the difference. Here's the difference. 
there's six years of kaiju max so something's working yeah that's true uh valid point i hadn't thought of it like that all right yeah, i mean like we're doing it it's think of it it's a creator owned series if those if those don't uh don't take off by the second trade no one's going to be throwing their money at it that's true that's true i guess it's boombox that's is, is it boombox or just regular boom no it's oni Oni, man, what am I think? I don't know anything about Oni's uh, creator. No, rights. no, like, I, who cares? I, no, I, I, I totally get it. But yeah, I mean, th- that makes sense. I mean, it's, I mean, you don't want to look at, and you, you don't want to make it sound craven, like you're like selling out for specific things. But at the same time, it's just being practical more than anything. It's, it's just like looking at, and and also, what can you throw your weight behind and help out? Like that's one thing I like to do. To, I mean, not that like I, you know, you you want to just be a like a pure like. <laughs> As, as they called me on diversity in comics, a shill. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's like at the same time, you do you want to support the things that you're really passionate about. And like it seems like deep down, that's what you're trying to do is you're trying to unlock and give opportunity to people's passions. Let, let me let me ask you this, David. Do you think do you think that there is a giant uh, brand awareness for the comic Homesick Pilots? Like, do you think that that? No, but the- it's a good comic. It, it's a great comic, but that's not that's not going to drive people. So if a comic site is caring about a book like that, they're either A, reviewing literally everything, right. or B, they found something that they have something that they want to say about, that they feel passionately about, that the comic elicited an emotional response from them, that they wanted to take their time to make a thing about that work. So they're evangelists. Kind of. Yeah. At the yeah. end of the day, it's there's there's comics that we cover frequently that are because we think they're bad and we think that people should like wake up to the fact that they're bad. <laughs> Not naming any names on those. You could you could look at the site and figure out those. We aren't subtle. Uh but you can you can still say something about that. Like I would rather review a terrible comic that I was fascinated by mm-hmm. and I do every month. Then a comic that is like fine, mm-hmm. that is okay, that's mediocre, that's just not doing it. Give give me something to give me something to reach out and like feel and touch and something that's gonna be excite me in any way possible. And I'm gonna be loud about it. And I think that's what that's what comic sites should do. I mean, you can talk about journalistic integrity to the cows come home. And yes, you need to be ethical and you need to be reasonable when you have a conflict of interest and things like that. But you're talking about Superman most of the time. And you're talking about if this book about Superman was good or not. So maybe just accept that you're talking about Superman <laughs> and like engage with it on that level and talk about how this could be the best or the worst Superman thing it is. But like, I don't know. Just be excited. You're a comics fan. You're spending your hobby doing a weird thing where you make a comic book site or you talk about something on Twitter or anything. You're you care about this thing. Be excited about being excited about it. I like it. I don't even remember what the question was. No, I just got on a weird soapbox. I'm I'm all about that soapbox. I mean, honestly, there are worse things in the world than enthusiasm. And especially if it's OK, like. I this is a weird way to phrase it, but like productive enthusiasm. If it's it's not like, you know, I'm going to tell people what the right Star Wars to like is or something like that. It's just like I like this thing, and yeah, I, I, there's worse things in the world than that. And you know what? I'm glad that people can find it on Comics XF. I wish you the best of luck with all of that. But Zach, that is all I have for you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk about all of that, the X Men election, rigging it for your own favor, and everything else. I appreciate I you that. taking the time. I didn't say that. <laughs> Did, did, you cannot quote that. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Off Panel with Comics XF's Zach Jenkins. You can find Comics XF on Twitter at, at Comics XF and on its site, ComicsXF.com. Love Off Panel want to support it? Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts today and give the show a rating and review while you're at it, but five stars only. You can also support the show by backing it on Patreon. Find the show at patreon.com slash off panel. And when you back it on there, you get early access to each week's podcast as well as weekly content and more. Want even more? Subscribe to my subscription comic site, Sketched, at sketch.com for long form articles, interviews, and the rest of the site's content and its members only forum. 
You can find Off Panel and Sketched on social media by liking it on Facebook at slash Sketched. That's S-K-T-C-H-D. Follow on Twitter at, at SketchComic or following me at, at Slice Fried Gold. Big thanks to all my existing patrons, including Bradley Rutter, Carl Troy, Megan Morrison, Brandon DePillis, Patrick Brower, Declan Shelby, Dan Garino, Josh Williamson, Adam Freeman, Ben Wild, Brian Klein Q, SB, Antonio Offen, Nick Bennett, Daniel Whitfield, Scotty Young, Susanna Polo, Jeff Weir, Reed Hinkley Barnes, Mario Tiambang, ObjectedTheComic.com, Andrew Carita, Matt Mahoney, Charlie Chu, Stephen Hall, Pensacola Pop Comics, Kim Eslin, Philip Myra, C- Christian Shelton, Kenny Porter, Chris Pacello, Torn Grunbeck, Fuzz Bubbles, Chris Top, Transmitter Down, Waltz Comics and Books, Carl Mizell, Danny Ollie, Paul Salates, Akil Wilson, Alex Dimitriopoulos, Terry Dodson, Leon and King. Guess. Keegan Ray, Wesley Gift, Sean Kirkham, Alistair Ross, Julio Anta, Brett A. Schmidt, Jason Goodmanson, Paul Reinwald, Vita Ayala, Tara Ferguson, Dave Slusher, WMQ Comics, Akil Kokachi, Phil White, Sean Pinello, Ken Heidelman, Philip CV, Al Ewing, Ryan Alcock, David Kelly, Rob Wilson IV, Nick Polito, Owen McCready, Brendan Fletcher, Gary Maloney, Jonathan Nilsson, Matthew Groom, Jason Nassi, Adam Bogart, Matthew Taylor, Nick Patera, Jacob Sorelli, Ford Gilmore, David Brawley, Nick Hull, Bjorn Basin, John Hendricks, Steve Anderson, Ian Maxfield, Cliff Chang, Benjamin Shipper, Colin McMahon, Chris Palmer, Scott McGovern, Nathan Fairburn, Kat McKenzie, Adam Highfield, Fiona Staples, Chris Halloran, Mark Abnett, Mike Murphy, Michael Shirley, Tom Barnett, Jim Demonacos, Norbert, Nicolo, James Kaplan, and Mission Comics Art in San Francisco. You guys are all the best. A quick thanks to Upright T-Rex Music, who wrote performed Off Panel's theme song just for the show. Check out their music on Spotify because it's completely delightful. Thanks for listening, and tune in next week for another episode.